Well, hello. This is, this is the 5 o'clock, 5.30, whatever we are. Uh, welcome to part five of five of a teaching series we're doing at Northview called Ecclesia. My name is Jesse, and if we haven't met personally yet, that's probably because my family and I are fairly new to Northview, but I'm grateful that I get the privilege of closing out our series. Uh, It's a series that's been about the who and the what of this thing called church, and today we're talking about how the church exists for the good of the family, of the family. We're going to anchor our time in Deuteronomy chapter 6, so I'd invite you to head there if you've got a Bible. And as you're heading there, a quick recap, especially for those of us who uh, maybe can't, haven't tracked week to week with this. Week 1 was foundational for uh, our time today and for the series as a whole. Pastor Mark had discussed how the church, it's not an institution, it's not a building, but it's an assembly of people. And Jesus is the one behind this thing that's being built, primarily unto the end of the glory of God, that God would be honored in us and God would be honored through us. But there are other things as well. We went on to see how it exists for the good of the city, the good of one another. Last week, the good of the nations. And today we're finishing with how it exists for the good of the family. But as we begin, I think there's something important to frame this whole conversation we're having tonight. So most of you uh, don't know me very well in this, in this room or in any room for that matter. So I thought, like, you know what, let's, let's do something that could shape your perspective of me a little bit. Let me tell you a few things. For example, I could tell you that I have published a book on this very subject that we're speaking about tonight. Or, uh, not a lot of people look like they believe me on that one, but, or I could tell you that right out of high school, I spent several months in South Africa. More plausible, maybe. Okay, one more. Um, I could also tell you that I was a stuntman for the movie called Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. And I could also tell you that each of those things I just told you is not true at all at all. One of them is true about my wife, though. So why, why go through this? Why tell you these things? Because our starting point matters. What I could tell you about who I am would influence your view of me. And for your starting point, for your perspective to be shaped by any one of those things I mentioned, they might make you want to listen to me a bit more, or maybe a bit less, if you're not a Star Wars person, uh, especially, or, or maybe because you know, all those were lies. So now you're like, I can't trust the thing this guy says. What, why is he up there? But think, think about this. Qualities and experiences give us a lens that influence and shape our perspective. And this is exactly the type of thing that happens with the topic of family. There are fewer topics, there are very few, that interact with something that is so personal to each of us. Because each of us carries a history when it comes to family. Each of us also carries a hope when it comes to family. Things that have happened, things that are happening, things that we hope will happen. Spoken or unspoken things private things, public things. And there's also another layer for us here because it's also Mother's Day weekend. A weekend that another pastor friend of mine says is the most emotionally charged weekend to preach. And I don't know if that's true for you or not, but for some of us, this very time of year shapes how you might be feeling right now. So what we all need more than to hear from me is we need to hear from Jesus. So I want to pause one more time at this point in our, in our service to, to pray and ask for his help, that each of us would hear him regardless of what starting point we have. Let's pray together. Father, you see every person's starting point in every room where this message is being heard. And so I simply pray that this time would be faithful to your word and that it would be helpful to your people. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
So Deuteronomy chapter 6. What I want to help us think about and to consider today, regardless of our starting point, regardless of our perspective as we're coming in, is that God is building a spiritual family for his glory. And as he does, those people and those people's families are impacted for good. They're impacted for good. Every person and every family finds their specific flourishing in the general calling of the spiritual family, the church. And the called out people of God, as we've talked about ecclesia, are organized around some general principles that reach back to the earliest community of faith. And it's within the general calling of this community that each family and each person can find its maximum flourishing. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, I want to take us there for these reasons. I'm going to start with verses 1 to 3. We've heard some of this passage already read for us tonight, but let's go back there together. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over, to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, and a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the first thing I want us to see from this text, that God's ways leads to intergenerational flourishing. So what's the context? What's going on here in these verses? Well, there's a people group called the Israelites. They were in slavery in Egypt. God gets them out of there in this amazing Exodus event. God has made a covenant, a binding agreement of relationship with these people. They're the called out people. They're being led by their rescuer God in the wilderness. They're treasured there. Not trapped anymore in Egypt, but treasured in the wilderness. And along with this new identity comes a new activity. Along with new life comes a new lifestyle. God is leading them to a promised land. And here God is reminding them in this passage, through their leader Moses, of some important things. Fear the Lord. Why? Do what he's told you. Why? Why? Because God's ways lead to intergenerational flourishing. So how does, how does this, though, connect with what the church is supposed to be about here and now in 2023? Well, just like in Deuteronomy, the people of God are given instructions in community and are set up to keep them in community. So here's the connection we ought to make, that the church, the ecclesia, the people of God, are the community that best reinforces flourishing through fearing God. Or another way to put it, the spiritual family reinforces that God's ways are actually good for me and for my family. Do you, do you feel the importance of this? Like maybe, maybe this will help. I, I know most of you don't know me, so let's, let's try something else here. Let's do another big group icebreaker. Uh, it'll, it'll help me see how much I have in common with you and you with me, uh, regardless of where you're watching us. You can do this with the people around you just so that you can kind of gauge how much do we have in common with this guy up, up here. Uh, it'll help me to see this. Um, I'll tell you something about me. And if it applies to you, if you agree with it, if it also could describe you, just, just raise your hand, show me that we're, we're together on this. And I promise, these things are actually true this time. All right, trust me, they're actually, they're actually true this time. So here, let's, let's try one. I prefer coffee over tea. My people, my people, I see you. Okay, uh, how about this? I prefer appetizers over desserts. I'm causing division in the church today, all right? Okay, Uh, another, another. When it comes to summer, I prefer it, like, the hotter the better. Okay, well, if if your hand's not raised, I will try and sympathize with you tonight and for the rest of this year. Uh, Okay, one more, one more. Um, And be careful about raising your hand on this one. I sometimes struggle to believe that doing what God says is good for me. Yeah. 
That's kind of the problem, isn't it? Like we all, if we're, if we're honest, probably wrestle with that one and we, we need some help to have this truth reinforced. Because we might find it easy to say, especially in a room like, like this on a weekend, that God's ways are, are good, that, that doing what he says is good, but, but saying it and doing it are two very different things. Especially when most of our lives are not spent in a room like this on the weekend. For example, we could go back one page to, to Deuteronomy chapter 5. One of the commands that God is asking them to keep for their good. Deuteronomy 5.16, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Command and promise. Fearing God leads to flourishing. Now on Mother's Day weekend, you might be thinking, well, well yeah, I got, I got that one figured out. At least the moms are hoping, I hope, I hope my family's got that one figured out. But some of us honestly struggle with even just this one. I was, I was sitting with a, with a friend recently who was feeling a bit down, and he was just describing to me uh, the, the strain he's had in his relationship with his parents, especially, especially with his mother because of some of the things that she had said to him, words that wounded him, words that he carried with him for, for a long time. And yet, one of the things that God says is we're supposed to forgive people, like generally, and when it comes to your parents, to honor them specifically. And I know I, I sense in him what I sometimes sense in myself. It's like, but you don't, you don't know what they said to me. You, you, you don't know. I, I just don't know why is God asking me to do this. It, it doesn't feel like that would be good for me. It doesn't feel like acting on what he said would be good for me. Do you, do you, ever, do you ever feel that way? You ever, you ever catch yourself thinking, maybe in a conversation with somebody, or as, you're, as you think about God's word, you think, I just, I just wish God didn't say this. What's, what's weird to me about it, because that is me too, what's weird is that you and God both want what's best for you. Like, me and God both want what's best for me. The problem is that we disagree with God about what that looks like and how to get there. Like in verse 3 of Deuteronomy 6, Hear therefore, Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. I think every generation faces a struggle with this, though. Like in our country, for example, it might be more normal to believe that, that the Bible is actually a source of harm. Like, whatever is said in here, it can't be for our good. The, the stuff that's said in here, these are things to move past, to make progress as a society. And when I see this, when I notice it myself, I'm reminded of this little place in a little book of the Old Testament, Malachi, where God comes with this charge against his people and says the, these words, Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What profit, what is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? What good comes from doing what God says? Is that, is that where you are today? Maybe, maybe a question we could ask ourselves to, to diagnose this would be something like this. Where am I taking what God says is optimal and making it optional? God says something, says this is for my good, and I go, ah, maybe. You see, this is why I'm thankful for the church. Because when I've wrestled with trusting God or taking him at his word, there's been a gathering where I've heard God's word preached where I've seen people passionately worship, where I've received prayer, where I've heard the stories of those who have gone through the real stuff faithfully and come out the other side. That in a very real way, in seasons of my life, where I've struggled to live faithfully, the people of God have modeled a different way and demonstrated that not only is doing what God says actually good, 
It's good for all generations. All of them. Did you notice in verse 2 of Deuteronomy 6 that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son, and your son's son, like all the days of your life, across all the generations. We heard earlier in this specific room, Psalm 145 read. Did you catch some of those phrases? Like verse 4, one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Or verse 7, they shall pour forth the fame of what? Your abundant goodness. And shall sing aloud of, of what? Of your righteousness. Every generation of the church has the calling to care for the spiritual well-being of the next generation of the church. Because God has always had a vision for all generations. And for the church today, we need to see that the responsibility is here to, to live and to teach as if God's ways are actually good for us and for our families. Not compromising on what God says, not changing what God says, not apologizing for what God says. I was, I was meeting with a, a mentor of mine recently, and, and he said uh, something as he was reflecting on his life, something that, that stuck with me. It was this comment where he said, I'm not really sure we've made disciples until our disciples have made their own disciples. Our children and our children's children, as Deuteronomy says. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul talks about how when he brought the gospel to people, it was like he became their father in the spiritual family. And, and this is a calling for us too. Like we don't, we don't want to just do Sunday services and, and Bible studies and theology courses and community groups just to grow up to be spiritual adults or to become spiritual parents. And more than that, spiritual grandparents. Like, have you ever thought about this? Like, who are your grandchildren in the faith? The church, as it reinforces that God's ways lead to intergenerational flourishing, helps us to do this. Which is why I think that my family and I, we lose something when we're not anchored to the local church. And in light of what Deuteronomy 6 has hit on thus far, I wonder if one of the things that, that any generation is going to lose if they wander away from the church is the regular reminder that God's ways are good. Because the spiritual family reinforces that God's ways are actually good for me and for my family and for yours too. Let's keep going in our text here, though. Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 4 and just down to verse 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. So the second thing I want us to see from this text is this, that God is the one deserving of our undivided allegiance and love. Okay, so how does this part fit into our conversation about the church? Well, I think we need to see that the church, the, the ecclesia, the, the people of God, are the community that best reorients us to fidelity to God. Or another way to put it, the spiritual family reminds me and my family about who God really is and how to actually live rightly. So, so here's what I was thinking this past week as I, as I got to this spot in the, the text. Why did, why did they need reminders? What, what was it that caused them to be disoriented and need reorienting to fidelity to God? Again, from context, we could think about all of what some of these people had experienced about God and, and, and with him. They're, they're, they have these vivid situations in Egypt. They saw the Red Sea part so they could walk through it. They were given food and water in the wilderness, miraculously, predictably. One chapter earlier, Deuteronomy 5, Moses describes how God spoke to them out of the fire on a mountain, like, like they were face to face with God. They saw these things, they heard these things, they felt these things. And we're, we're here thinking possibly, well, if I had all of that, 
I'd never wander away from God. The problem, I think, is that they have, and they had, what we have today. Like, read ahead in Deuteronomy, or in the following books of the Old Testament. They were about to go to a land that was filled with people worshiping other things. A place filled with idols. Other options for what could be God. Other options for what they could devote their lives to and to love. Images of these things around them. And they didn't even carry these images around with them in their pockets like we do. Like whatever, whatever we, we think about, we can access, like our eyes can access with just a few taps of a thumb. And some of those things are not leading us closer to God. God knew and God knows that despite all of what he has done and shown his people that there would be competition for their affection. And it was the community call to remind and to reorient. To point us back to who God really is and how to actually live rightly. Their task then is the task of the church today to declare who God is to one another and to love him with all of our capacity. He is our God. He alone. So maybe follow this train of thought then. So how, how, do, we, how do we love God? Well, by doing what he says. Like in John 14, Jesus says that whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Okay, so that's, if that's how we do it, what happens when we do it? Well, one of the things that happens is that Jesus calls us family. In Matthew 12, there's this discussion about who Jesus' mother and brothers are. And he says in verse 50, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So first of all, that's, that's really cool. Like that, that's really encouraging. I mean, for those of us with broken or divided families, like there's something there that unites us in such a meaningful way. It's like we read in the Psalms that God, he places the lonely in families. So there's something there for us as we consider how our coming to Jesus brings us into relationship, not just with him, but with his people, with his family. Like, be, be encouraged in that. Because I know some of us, we don't come from, from whole families. The spiritual family can fill the gaps in your biological family. But what we also might be thinking here is, okay, well, if, if, if we love God by doing what he says, boy, he says a lot of things, and that's kind of hard. Yeah, it, it, it is. Like, they, they couldn't do it. They didn't do it. Like, it didn't go well with them, and this is why they needed what we, on the other side of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension have available to us, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because he gives the church the power to do what he says. Like Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Eventually, God's gonna promise to the people of Israel in places like Jeremiah 31, I'm going to put my law within them. I'm going to write it. Where? On their hearts. I'm going to give them a new heart and a new power, and I'm going to cause them to walk in my ways. Like, what a, what a profound truth. Again, I think my family and I lose something if we aren't anchored to the local church. Because in light of what we're seeing in Deuteronomy, there's, there's something there to be lost if I don't have that reorienting, reminding community around me. It reminds me of what Paul says in 1 Timothy 3 about the church. He, he describes it God's household, which is the, the church of the living God. And he makes this statement, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And the truth does, does two things. First, if it is true that there will be things that distract us and, and, and pull us from seeing God accurately and living rightly, then it is a huge advantage to have the church to reorient us to fidelity to God. But also, 
Not only can truth help correct one another as spiritual family, it can help us care for one another. Because, second, if it's true that there will be things that bring us trouble and pain, then it's a huge advantage to have the church to reorient us with this as well. Rather than being vulnerably isolated, the spiritual family reminds me and my family about who God really is and how to actually live rightly amidst idolatry, yes, but also amidst difficulty. So in the, in the spirit of, of getting to know me better, here's another fun fact. As of like literally this weekend, Mother's Day weekend, I have lived through the same amount of Mother's Days without my mom as with her. Cancer killed her when I was 16. So I had 16 with, with, without her. Well, actually, I had 17 with her, and now 17 without her. And around the time she died, we'd moved to a new town, and so there were some other things that changed for me then, too. But they weren't bad things. I went to a church youth group for the first time. We started attending a church on the weekend more regularly. And you know what happened? Not only did this community reinforce for me that God's ways are actually good, but they helped a disoriented teenager by reorienting him to who God really is. And it was the people of God. In my biological family, yes, but also in the wider spiritual family. That helped take a teenager whose foundations were being shaken and reminded me of who God really is and how to live rightly. And this is who we can be for one another. Regardless of what you've experienced in your family, you can give and receive in a way that helps you hear, like hear who your God is. The church is, is where love for God will be on display in a counter-cultural way, and as each of us stewards our gifts for the common good, there will be loving challenge, yes, accountability, yes, but also care. Which leads me to finish with three more verses, Deuteronomy 6, 7 to 9. You shall teach them, these commands, diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. A third and final thing uh, we see from our text today is that God desires discipleship in every way through every day for every person. And this fits in our conversation about church because the church, the ecclesia, the people of God, are the community that best resources us for the future with God. Or to put it another way, the spiritual family resources me and my family for our future. And if we haven't caught it by now, I hope we understand the future really matters. I think about these verses and the related concepts from a place like Psalm 78, for example, where it says that God established a testimony in Jacob, appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise to tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. So have, have we grasped this? Are we praying towards this? And keep in mind, I, I hope we're not thinking about the future in terms of what's good for us as in Northview Community Church. It's not primarily for the good of Northview. It's for your good and it's for their good. Deuteronomy, teach these things diligently to your children. Why? So they can set their hope in God. We're not trying to save an institution. We're trying to save people. 
diligently. And I fully realize that most of us view ourselves as busy. <laughs> most of us have filled our schedules with things that we're working on, investing in, etc. All, all of us trying to succeed at things that, that matter to us. But I have a question. It's a question I, I wrote down for myself as I was out for a walk with, with a latte on the trail the other day that I, that I want to ask out loud so that you can ask yourself. And it's this question. Am I succeeding at the right things? Like in the past year, I would say I've succeeded at some things. I'm better at budgeting my finances. I'm better at disc golf. I've... Uh, Succeeded at seeing all of the Marvel movies in theater, which actually might go against the first one I said, the budgeting part. So, um, I mean, like, these aren't wrong things. They're not bad things. I mean, lots of phase four and five is bad, but like, like I know there are better things. And I asked myself, have, like, have I succeeded at praying regularly with my family? Have I succeeded in, in showing my kids that Jesus is a real person to me? Here's, here's why I think this text is so helpful. It takes into account the fact that discipleship really is an all-day, everyday posture. Because here's the thing. You cannot predict or anticipate or plan for some of the best and most influential moments you'll have with people. Especially with your own kids. Case in point, I took my two boys camping a few weeks back. I needed an escape from, from the office because Pastor Ezra runs a tight ship. And uh, we, went, uh, we went tenting along the Vetter River. Just three of us crammed into like a one-man tent. Uh, super squishy, uh, but awesome. And after like a full you know, experience together, it's like 10 p.m. It's finally getting dark. And in the silence of my tent, the silence shifts, and my then six-year-old and five-year-old start talking about a specific word. And it was a word I had not heard them say before, a word that I didn't expect to be brought up 15 minutes after whacking each other in the eye with glow sticks in the tent. But nonetheless, the conversation was happening, and it was the word sin. So I started asking me questions, which took me to topics I did not think we would get to for years to come. And I'm like... Okay, like, this, this is the moment for this conversation? Like, this is when we're going to talk about this? Like, okay, I, I remembered. Oh, yeah, yeah. Deuteronomy 6 said, teach God's commands diligently to my children, talking about them. When? When, when, when was that? Was, was a tent at 10 p.m. one of those? <laughs> when you lie down. Oh, man, there it is. A moment to talk about who God is, what he's really like how he's made the world, how his ways are for our good. And it's like God knows that like, discipleship happens in many cases like five minutes at a time. The encouragement of this text that I see is that if we really bring the reality of the gospel, if we really bring and work God's story into our everyday story, that it makes an impact. So can I speak to us who have relationships that, that matter, especially the ones in our families? Don't underestimate your personal impact on the future. And don't underestimate the community of faith. Like I know for sure that me and my family lose something if we're not anchored to a local church. There was a recent study done that described what created resilient Christians, people who grew up and continued to follow Jesus. And here's one of the findings they published in a book called Faith for Exiles. The top relational predictors of resilient Christians are these. I feel connected to a community of Christians. The church is a place where I belong. I feel loved and valued in my church. I feel connected to people older than me in my church. And the conclusion was that faith communities and Christian households then must become resilient villages designed with outcomes in mind. It's no accident at Downs Road we have kids serving this weekend. It's why we do things like commissioning parents through child dedication. 
because the spiritual family resources individuals and their families. So a final piece I want to close with, and, and I, I was thinking very much about this, this type of person. You, you might be here today hearing all this thinking, okay, but what about those in my family that have walked away from Jesus? You might be here and there are names in your mind of people you care about that don't know him at all. Like, Jesse, this is all well and good, but the person that I care about isn't one of those resilient Christians you're talking about. My kids, my grandkids, my brother, my sister, my dad, my mom. Like, Jesse, what about them? So I was driving the other day praying into that exact question. Like, Lord, what can I give someone who, who like myself, is exactly in that boat? Lord, what do you want to tell me? And instead of, instead of a quick fix, I thought again about Deuteronomy 6. I thought again about these principles from the Israelite community and how they are empower, empowered afresh for us as the church today with the Holy Spirit. And what helped me most was to think just something very simple, to commit to love and to prayer for as long as as it takes and to do it with the church because the church that Jesus is building is the community is the spiritual family that best reinforces best reorients best resources us and our families to flourish for generations to come and I can think of no people that better position me and those I care about to experience the goodness of God. So I want to pray for us that this would be so for his glory, but especially for us as we think about our families, regardless of what starting point we have, that you join me in this prayer. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you are near to each person. Thank you that you see exactly what each person is carrying. And so I pray that by your spirit, you would, in a way that makes sense and fits for each person, remind them that your ways are good. Remind them that you are worthy of their trust, and their obedience. And would you, for the names of people that we have in our minds, would you position us to join you in your good purposes coming to pass in these people's lives? For whoever it is, Draw these people to yourself, Father. Draw us to yourself. We thank you that you are gracious and compassionate, abounding in steadfast love. Empower us to do what we've heard today, what you've highlighted for each of us today with the great gift of your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.